Hello, and welcome to the 2020 series presented by the New York Film Academy. The 2020 series are conversations with creative visionaries about craft, creativity, and collaboration. I'm Liz Hinline. I'm creative director and filmmaker at New York Film Academy. And we will be doing 20 minutes of shop talk and then 20 minutes of answering questions from you, the global audience. So please do um, write into the Q&A. This is a time to get real advice, inspiration, and just pure knowledge from a seminal director and ASCDP, which is crazy. Um, Gary McLeod, we'd love to talk to you today. Hi, Gary. Hey. How are you? Thank you so much for showing up. I always am happy and excited and relieved to see people show up. Um, it's a pleasure. It's so interesting. So I was looking at your IMDb page and, and besides being incredibly extensive, it really looked like you had a master plan. You started out as an AC, C. I don't even know if you were a loader before that, but you went from AC to camera operator to cinematographer to now you're a director. Was this like, was this a war plan that you had done? Plan gives it too much credit. It was uh, a combination of luck and yeah. Did I want to become a director? Absolutely. But did I have like a step-by-step -step master plan? Not a chance. I worked, uh, I didn't go to film school. I was a, uh, I literally started at the bottom rung of the camera department. I wasn't a loader, so I was a second AC, but mm -hmm. I started at the bottom rung of the camera department and just slowly worked my way up that ladder, which took a long time. It was not, when I came into the business, there was no, instant career, uh, especially in camera. Uh, the union was very small and very tight mm -hmm. and not very welcoming, frankly. So uh, it took a lot just to get into the local as a second AC. Um, eventually that happened uh, through an apprenticeship program that the uh, IA ran. Mm -hmm essentially against their will because uh, <laughs> they were, you know, getting, they were getting a lot of heat from the federal government about the fact that the only way you could get in the local is to be a relative. Wow. So they said, okay, okay, you can't do that anymore. So they created an apprenticeship program um, mm -hmm. and uh, chose, I think in the year I got in, there were 2000 applicants and they chose 10 people. Wow. Yeah. So it was an enormous long shot. So anybody who says that was my plan was to be one of those 10 people, they'd be lying. But anyway, that's how I got into the uh, into the camera local. And then it was, you know, a couple of years as a second and 13 years as a first and seven years as an operator before I even became a DP. Oh, 100 percent. So even, you know, most that's what's sort of interesting. But at this time, were you still like were you gunning to be a cinematographer because you just, that is the route you know that is the sort of like and and people do stop especially you were first AC in some very large shows that that's like a master position unto itself it can also be the golden handcuff mm. because uh, mm. once you start working th those kinds of movies you can work all the time once you get a reputation in those yeah. kind of movies the danger is you don't move from there because you're making a, you know, I was working all the time. The phone was ringing. I didn't have to struggle for work. Mm -hmm. um, every time you move up the ladder, you start, you're not a rookie, but you're starting at a real disadvantage. So what did you, and I'm just curious, and we will get to dragon, but I think I'm fascinated with your DP story because I know the, the lengths it takes to get to there. Yeah. And then the fact that you're switched to, and each time. So to go from AC to even, handling the camera operating did you have to like practice at night or go to panavision and practice like how did you even get like attuned to that sure uh well if you're smart while you're on set every chance you get uh when nobody's looking you're on the camera practicing uh, because also those were the days uh especially if you couldn't call yourself a camera operator if you couldn't operate a gearhead right and that's a 
a, a specific skill that you can only get better at by practice. Mm -hmm. There's no book you can read. There's no course you can take. You just have to do it a thousand times. It's literally one of those 10,000 repetition kind of things. Mm -hmm. So every chance I got, I would get on the gearhead and practice. Um, and, uh, you know, some of it's just hand-eye coordination and, and I'm, I had pretty good hand-eye coordination. So it wasn't a huge ordeal for me. I, you can, you can struggle mightily just learning how to operate a gearhead. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, you had to be able to operate a gearhead. You couldn't just operate a fluid head uh, and call yourself uh, an, a camera operator. Whereas I guess now you can. But usually they'll throw you onto something to like, you know, yeah. on a on a big arm and with a with a different head on it and then be like, okay, go. Yeah. And I've seen people crash and burn mm. because they just didn't have uh, they didn't have the time mm -hmm. operating wheels. Right. To get good at it. And suddenly you're asking them to do something. So they want a joystick or they want some other not so good alternative because right. that's the only way they can do it so uh, you know and also i worked for some real strict i mean the hard ass guys who uh who, who pushed who pushed you hard uh, they were unforgiving uh, so it was it was like it was, it was like the military but it paid better they were like <laughs> you know they were like, Drill instructors. I totally, I totally know. I, I worked for Rodrigo Preto, and I was like a, uh, a on set colorist, but I worked underneath people. And the my second, who was above me, was in the army before. Mm, <laughs> so mm, <laughs> there was no talking on set. There was exactly. nothing. You were standing at attention, even if you had to stand there for five hours and not move. And God help you if you get caught not paying attention for a second. Just for yeah. that instant when you turn your head and something happens. Right. Yeah, there was a lot of reaming that went on as I was coming up through the ranks. So then you get so to who gave you, how did you get into the camera operating? How did you be able to make that a career step? Uh, wow, well, good question. Um, what was I? I was working, I'm trying to remember my first job as an operator. What I would do is I would do like uh, student films. Mm -hmm. I would do small projects just to get the experience it was the same thing moving from operating to, to shooting Warner Brothers is not offering a new guy uh, uh, you know a 200 million dollar movie right you start small so uh, I did a bunch of little projects whatever I could get my hands on just mm -hmm. to get the practice and eventually uh I'm trying to think of what is it actually. I can't even remember the first show I was actually a union camera operator on. And and then from there to get to, to, to the cinematography level. Which is another well, also not coming from lighting. Yes. Was that is that did you pick that up through Lily all the hours on set? Sure. I worked for some really good cinematographers as an assistant and as an operator. And um, again, if you're paying attention, you should be learning uh, all the time. If, if, if you're not learning, you're making a mistake. So you're, you're watching, you're figuring out, okay, why do you make that choice? Why do you put the light there? Why mm -hmm. do we have it on the other side? Why is he always key from that side? And, uh, and, you know, get away with as many questions as you can without annoying the hell out of the DP. Right, right. And, and, and just, you have to really look on it as this is my opportunity to learn from a master craftsman. And you don't get that opportunity very often. So you're a fool not to event, uh, 100%. take advantage of that. And so it was known, it was sort of known around that you you wanted to, you know, it's not unusual to shift into cinematography, but there's some ACs who take the golden handcuffs. Absolutely. So take the, you know, because being a camera is really creative and intuitive and somewhat relaxing because you don't have a lot of responsibility. Right. Being a camera operator is like being the vice president. Right. You have a lot of status, but not really that much power. So. Uh, and you don't have to carry anything. And you don't have to carry heavy things. And right. when they call a wrap, 
you know, after years of being the guy cleaning the equipment after they call a wrap and, you know, hauling everything back to the truck and blowing the dust off, to suddenly have a job where when they say that's a wrap, you pick up your coat and go home was pretty good. Yeah. Um, so, but it's also, again, that's the golden handcuffs. You can stay there a long time if you choose to, mm -hmm. or you can keep reaching for the next rung on the ladder. And uh, that's a tough one. Every move up the ladder gets tougher and tougher because it's a pyramid. And so there's not a lot of room at the top. And did you have mentors going up in stages? Yeah, the, uh, as, as a, the person I learned the most from as a, an assistant was, uh, I was Stephen Goldblatt's assistant mm. for a long time. And Stephen was a uh, really talented cinematographer and also a really generous, uh, sorry, a really generous uh, spirit. Mm. So he was enormously helpful in uh, the opportunities I got by working with him. And uh, I learned an enormous amount from him about lighting, about not just about the technical part of it, but also the politics of it. Like what are some takeaways that, you know, because the politics, once you're at that level with craft, then it is the politics. It is about the And politics. it's not a bad thing. It's just, it is what it is, right? And, and so what, what, what were things um, that you saw, especially maybe, especially if you were starting to do the DP, uh, directing thing, it's like how they're dealing with talent. So. Dealing um, with talent was a huge part of it. Um, making sure that uh, the actors feel attended to, specifically women, when you're lighting. Uh, he never walked away without letting them know he was paying attention. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, he tells a, a really funny story about uh, he shot Prince of Tides mm -hmm. and, uh, with Barbara Streisand, right. who had fired the previous DP, who was a big deal DP. It wasn't right. like some guy fresh out of film school. This guy right. was like an Oscar winning DP and she didn't like the way she looked. So Steven gets brought on to the movie. He, uh, Barbara had a habit of taking her hand mirror <laughs> to look at her lighting. Mm. And she would often hold it right in front of the key light and then wonder Lock why it. there was a shadow on her face. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, you have to gently, you know, and she's the star. It's her show. You can't. Right. You got to gently just slide her hand out of the way. So, <laughs> so one day in daily, she just said, you know, Stephen, I just, I don't know. Today, today you missed the mark. And uh, Stephen said, you know, it wasn't like I wasn't trying real hard because I, I knew, you know, the last guy. So <laughs> she wanted to reshoot oh. the scene. Oh, wow. Really? That, you know, she was that far off the mark. So uh, so the next day, because the director certainly wasn't going to say no to Barbara, the next day uh, they reshot the scene. And Stephen said, I lit it exactly the same. Because the first time I lit it was as good as I could light it. It wasn't like I was holding back anything. So I just basically did the same thing again. The next day in dailies, she's ecstatic. She said, now that's what I look, was looking for. So part of it is just a piece. But what's the takeaway? Uh, sometimes you're just going to have to appease people, even if it doesn't necessarily make sense. Mm -hmm. It's not your job to get into an, a, a technical argument with, uh, with the talent about how they should be lit. You light them the best way you know how and do a lot of nodding. Um, so it seemed like the mentalist was, was your sort of takeoff transition point into directing. Yeah, Is that absolutely. correct? Yes. And you were there on that show for a while, a long time as a cinematographer. Yes, that was my break. And, and what, what did you, was it during that show that, or was this something, you know, how were you thinking about that as you're sort of heading towards that? Well, the previous show I'd, I'd been on had been uh, a show with Courtney Cox uh, called Dirt. It was an FX mm -hmm. show. And Courtney actually offered me an episode uh, to direct, mm -hmm. which I said, of course. And then uh, the writers went out. And 
So I was literally on deck to direct mm -hmm. the next episode mm -hmm. when the show went down. Right. Chris Long was the producing director on the show, who was also one of my very best friends. He's a wonderful man. He, uh, by the time the, the strike ended up, ended the uh, show couldn't make its delivery dates. So FX pulled the plug. Mm -hmm. But Chris got um, The Mentalist as a producing director. And he brought me with him. And he brought me with him and said, you know, uh, I know you got burned on the last one. I will watch out for you this time. It won't happen season one. It probably won't even happen season two, but I will build the relationships with the studio, the network, the talent, the right, the producer, the uh, showrunner, all the people that have to say yes. I'll get them all aligned. And then I'll propose that you direct an episode, which is exactly what he did. And it worked wow. out. Yeah, it was, amazing. it was a wonderful thing to do. So had you at that point directed anything yourself previous to that? I directed some like second units on mm -hmm. shows I was shooting, uh, stunt units, but no, I really had no dramatic. Uh, I'd done one uh, 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 episodic episode many years before that never even got aired. It was, um, it was a show that got canceled I think, frankly, the reason I got the episode is because everybody, the, the star of the show, knew it was going to get canceled. And he said, look, you know, if, he threw me a bone. Right. I'll, right. You'll get a directing credit out of this, but I don't know. That it, it, and it never aired. And did you know that, not that you, not how would you know, but did you think like, this is something I would really like? I would like to, I've been doing the cinematography you know, I'm at a level now, I'm doing episodic, I'm getting a consistent paycheck, but I think the directing will be my, the thing that really is, works for me. Or... Yes, because I, by that point I had worked with, uh, I can't count the number of directors mm. and, and uh, some of whom were really, really good and some of them were not so good and a lot were in between, but uh, it suddenly, it, not suddenly, slowly occurred to me that this is a career that I could do. It mm -hmm. wasn't it wasn't so far out of reach. I think when you start off, it, being a director is something that just seems so remote. The, the odds of becoming a director seem so remote that uh, it ain't gonna happen. But uh, by that point in my career, I'd been around a long time at that point. And I worked as both a DP and uh, all the way up the ladder, I worked for, I, I, like I said, I can't count the number of directors. And I realized some of them, you know, were extraordinarily talented and maybe I was never going to be that guy. But there were others that were, you know, craftsmen. Right. That could put together uh, all the pieces, knew all the pieces that you needed and knew how to assemble them in a timely fashion, which is episodic television. And, and, I'm just curious. And then, what does your prep look like now for episodic versus like your prep that you did for DPing for episodic? Oh, it's so entirely different. Um, prep for episodic as a director is so much more involved with the writers. Uh, is uh, reassuring the actors, even in prep, that you're on their side, that you're going to watch out for them, that you're Sometimes actors are wary of DPs who have become directors because they think that you only care about the look, mm -hmm. that you're not really that interested in performance or story. You just want to do cool shots and they hate that. Mm -hmm. So coming in, you have to let them know that you care very much about character and performance and uh, that you're there for the full picture. You're not just there to do cool shots. And do you say that, is that like something you actually say literally those words or? Literally like those words. Take them aside or you call them or introduce yourself or however it works. Yeah, we have a little conversation and I just reassure them that look, I'm here for you and I'm here to, to 
it's not my show. Mm -hmm. And I, you can't do episodic TV without understanding that, that you're not driving the boat here. The showrunner owns the show. Your job is to come in and give the showrunner the best possible version of their show that you can. So I have an advantage in that I spent many years shooting episodic television before I started directing it. So I, I have a good sense of what's doable Mm -hmm. on an episodic budget and on an episodic schedule and not just rely on you know master single uh, over over single single cut master over over single right. single cut you can do that all day and you go home early and you know people applaud you for being fast but that's not why i wanted to become a director that's right. like the assembly line directing right Right, was safety is the safety director. Exactly. And if, and if you found, because looking at your, you know, different shows that you've been doing, do you is there is there a slot like a genre or a slot that you like or that you are interested in? Because you seem yeah. to have announced very interesting. You did like Empire, and then you did um, when I wrote it down, you did the um, like famous in love you did all these sort of sort of more girly shows which i thought was really interesting because usually they, they want girly directors especially now generally um, speaking and i uh, think you know i wouldn't look at me and say there's a guy who should be directing 18 year old teenage girls and but it's what came my way and you know i i'm a sensitive guy I, I listen to them, <laughs> we I can... care about them. I make them know that I, I'm not just there to you know, knock out an episode as quickly as possible to move on, that I actually do care about the, the show and I care about their performance. And mm -hmm. uh, part of the job is making them feel like they're being listened to, mm -hmm. that they're not just being treated like clothes horses or something. So right. I do, I listen, I'm their friend. And I'm like their dad, you know, I'm mm -hmm. safe. I'm not, I'm their dad. Right, right. And is there, is there things that you're enjoying more or you feel like can flex more with maybe the combination of cinematography and directing? Well, one hour drama is really where I, that's what I'm good at. And, and, and I'm good at human kind of stories rather than stories about robots or werewolves or aliens or you know I, I don't know how to understand an alien that can push people through the wall or something it doesn't even appeal to me mm -hmm. what appeals to me is stories about actual people that i can like look at and say okay i get you as a person and uh i think we can tell a story together and and it's a human story that that's the part of directing that to me is the best the the technical stuff i I know well enough that I don't, I don't want to get bogged down in technique rather than the primacy has to come with the story. Mm -hmm. And then you know, I'll give you a couple, if you give me a little room, I'll definitely give you a couple of nice, big, wide, you know, sweeping, mm -hmm. uh, gone with the wind shots, but uh, that's gravy. Well, what I thought was really exciting is that, you know, we, we met at a, a sort of a directing acting uh, Beverly Hills Playhouse and, and that that you were working on your uh, um, vocabulary with actors. Yeah, absolutely. With actors. And, and how do you feel? Have you done other sort of education with that or how has that just become from being on set a lot that your vocabulary is? Yeah, has developed. I need to develop. That was a that was a really good idea, uh, a really good suggestion um, to go and take, because up till that point, as a DP, your relationship with actors is just entirely different. And mm -hmm. honestly, half the time you're just giving them, to, you know, turn your head slightly to the left and raise your chin, and and uh, you know, we'll make you look nice. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, as a director, it's a whole different set of skills and a whole different set of communication tools that you have to develop. And I realized I needed to take acting classes in order to develop those skills because uh, they just weren't skills I possessed. So uh, 
taking that class with Howie Deutsch, who was um, just a master at, at dealing with actors, with directing actors, with understanding actors, mm -hmm. uh, was the most valuable thing I did in transitioning from shooting to uh, to directing. I learned the started to learn the vocabulary and more than the vocabulary, just trying to see a scene from the actor's perspective rather mm -hmm. than from a lighting perspective. Right, hundred percent. What the characters going through and yeah, what the characters visualize going that exactly. All right, we have a bunch of questions here. We're going to jump into a few of them. Um, Jamie asked, have you noticed the push in film and television for production to do a more thoughtful job lighting different skin tones? Can you talk about your thoughts on that and even the, the past lack of attention to it? Oh, absolutely. It used to be, there used to be, and I, I, it might even still exist, I don't know since I haven't shot in a while, but there used to be something called the lily, which was a, a, a card, like a eight by 10 card with color patches and then a woman, a blonde white woman, uh, a photograph of this woman. And you would uh, photograph this for the lab so that the lab could set up to make that the standard. Mm. So what they were using for a photographic standard had nothing to do with the way I look or the way any black person looks or mm -hmm. Asian people or anybody else. It was in right. you know, a, a white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman was the standard. So if that's the orientation that you start with, you got to go a long way to start paying attention. And, and, and I've talked to so many Black actors who feel like they've been just neglected, underlit or not lit at all, or mm -hmm. lit in a way that, you know, clearly the person lighting has no idea how to handle them. Totally. Very, very, they get very fearful and not understanding the, the skin tones and, and using the like, you know, reflectivity of the skin and, yes. and, 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 and getting excited about it. And you know what? Let me just fix something. Sorry. I just make it crazy. It's just so blown out back there. <laughs> exactly. Anymore. Um, yeah, it's um, it's film. Also, the sensitivity of the medium now is so much better mm. than it used mm -hmm. to be. It used to be almost sure. impossible to to hold a black person and a very fair white person in mm -hmm. the same frame at the same time. Uh, and, and do justice by both of them. So oftentimes what would happen is the DP would favor the white actor, generally because they had more clout and the black actor would just kind of- Fade oh, away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Basically was, in the background. They went, yeah, just to say. Really? <laughs> On Lethal Weapon, I can't remember which one, one of them, uh, which Stephen Goldblatt shot, Mm -hmm. There's a scene where uh, I believe Danny Glover is driving. It's a two shot in the car, frontal two shot. Danny mm -hmm. Glover's driving, Mel Gibson sitting next to him. So, you know, Stephen has lit accordingly. But in the middle of the scene, they suddenly swap seats, which is tricky because you're in a moving car. It's not like you had the opportunity right. to slide in a, a, a net or diffusion right. or right. adjust the light in any way. Uh, it just, I could see his face just collapse. As his, <laughs> I think they did it kind of spontaneously. I don't think he right. knew that that was what was coming. So, but things are so much better now. There's so much more latitude in, in, mm -hmm. in the medium that it, it's not the, nightmare that it used to be is there so when you come on to the show with like say a dp you haven't worked with or is not your buddy is there a way as a director how, how are you working with them now what what's your respectfully mm -hmm. because when i was a dp nothing pissed me off more than a director who would come in in day one and pretend he was the dp mm. 
first of all, because unless you were a DP, you're not a DP. And you might know a little bit, but it's a classic case of little knowledge being dangerous. Mm -hmm. So you don't know where to put the key light. I know where to put the key light. And there's a reason I'm here as the DP. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, a Nazi about it, but just back off. Let me do my job, which mm -hmm. is the lighting. And you just deal with the actors and the writers and all that rather than, so now when I, I'm coming on to a show, I'm, I'm very respectful of the DP. I don't try to tell him how to do his job. If I have an idea that, uh, or if I don't feel like I'm getting what I, I want out of a scene, we'll have a respectful conversation. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel like I'm the source of all knowledge uh, on the set. I'm, I'm the director, but I'm not, I'm, I'm just, you, you learn humility if you're smart as a director, especially in episodic television. There are people that know a lot more about their particular craft than you do. So I don't tell the wardrobe people that, you know, whether she should wear the pink skirt and the blue blouse or the blue skirt and the pink blouse. I trust your judgment on that. Mm. And I'll tell somebody in a second, I trust your judgment on, on that. They must love that. They do. Respect them, you know, they know what they're talking about. They do and at that time. And I'm not there to change the look of the show. Uh, Veronica asks, Veronica from Italy asks, I would like to ask you, what was the best uh, cinema experience of your life? Of my life? Of your entire life, what was the uh, best? <laughs> okay, the most impactful mm -hmm. uh, was working on uh, Malcolm X. Mm, tell us more. That was like a life-changing experience for me because um, it was just such an important, you know, it, in the course of a career in the movie, especially in the Hollywood end of the business, you work on a lot of stuff that's not going to change anybody's life for the better. It's just a job. But every now and then you get lucky and you get on something that feels life changing. And uh, for me, that was Malcolm X. Um, thematically, dramatically, it was a huge huge picture uh, in terms of impact for me personally it was a huge and the travel you know i met nelson mandela oh wow yeah how many times in your life and i'm not that starstruck honestly but mm -hmm. nelson mandela is nelson mandela so that was a huge impact and what did you take away from watching watching spike work you know, he's, he's, uh, it, I'm not going to say the word genius because everybody throws that word around way too much. He's, he's got moments of inspiration that are just, uh, they're, they're his and his alone. And, uh, I've never worked for anybody like that. He's, 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 Sometimes it's tough to figure out what he wants because mm -hmm. he's not great verbally sometimes telling you exactly what he wants, but uh, he has moments of just inspiration. We re once you see the, the results of what he's trying to do, it, it's, it's inspiring. Um, there was a shot on, uh, I, can't remember, I think it was Clockers, where you know somebody walks in the door, mm -hmm. that was the operator, Somebody walks in the door and they, uh, Delroy Lindor walks in the door and he's going to go sit in a booth. So he walks in the door and I pan Delroy over and sit him down like you would as a camera operator. Spike said, no, 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 go the other way. What does that mean? Take two. Delroy walks in. I pan him in. I sit him down. Spike said, didn't I just tell you to go the other way? So now I'm like, I don't know what the back was. Go other way to what, right? Yeah, go all the way to what? So Delroy comes in. I said, all right, I'll show you what the other way is. And I panned the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. And I panned across the whole set and came around to land on Delroy as he was sitting down. Well, what that shot bought us was a chance to see this fantastic set mm -hmm. fully rather than just a little, you know, 90 degree pan. It was a 270 degree pan where we got to see the whole set. 
I just didn't realize that's what he was after. Right. Just saying go the other way didn't really connect. Yeah. Connect for me. But once I saw what he had in mind, uh, it was genius. Yeah. Yeah. Genius. Well, it's exciting to be around that. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to get yelled at. You know, you have to be ready for that because you're going to not get it sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so if you're, you know, somebody who's going to cry when they get yelled at, you're probably not going to survive with them very long. Exactly. Um, so we are coming to the end of our time, sadly. Mm. So if people want to look at your work, can they check out your website, stuff like sure. that? GaryMcLeod.com. Um, uh, a lot of that. Here's the sad truth. Getting uh, the networks to allow you to pull excerpts from their shows and put them on your website is not always, is frankly really difficult and becomes more and more difficult. Mm -hmm. There's a whole thing about internet intellectual property that uh, they're really nervous about. So anytime you call them up and say, I'd like to use a piece of your programming, even though I directed it, it's still right. your show. Right. You get shut down. Nine times out of 10, they'll say no. So unless it's an independent, it's pretty tough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, right. So, so there's stuff on, on your website and there's stuff that's in your credits. Yes. People can find. Yes. Okay. If you go through a, my agent, agents have access that I as an individual don't have because the networks kind of pretend they don't know that agents are handing out their work. Right. But it's really very, uh, very treacherous ground these days with intellectual property. I think they're just so afraid that they're going to get ripped off. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Well, it's so great having you on, Gary. It's just Thank been you. This was fantastic. Really great. We could talk forever. Sure. Um, and just, you know, great luck with your career. It's very inspiring. Thank you. And thank you everyone to New York Film Academy for you know the 2020 series and keep tuning in. And with that, goodbye, have a great week. Good luck to everyone.